Okay, welcome to another very interesting panel discussion at the Go Arts and Literary Festival. Um, this has some this basically loose, uh, loosely arranged around the American curriculum, but I think that there will be many lessons for us to learn about the way we look at academics in general. On the stage with me today, making her Goa Arts and Literary Festival debut, welcome Lucy San Pablo Burns. She is an Associate Professor of Asian American Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. Um, she has written monographs. Her publications include The Color of Theater, many essays in dance research journal and women in performance, and a forthcoming edited collection, California Dreaming, Production and Aesthetics in Asian American Art. Welcome, Lucy. Also with us today is Venka Tulipala, who is an associate professor of history at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. His book, which is on sale outside, I urge you to get it, is called Creating a New Medina. There it is, Venka Tulipala. Extremely well reviewed and outstanding new book. It's, uh, it's on state power, Islam, and the quest for Pakistan in late colonial North India. And moderating, something wrong with this mic, but moderating the session, our own Benedito Farrell, who doesn't need much introduction, but we all know him as a well known writer and person who writes very often on Goa, but he's also the Mellon Faculty Fellow in Asian and Middle Eastern Studies at the College of William and Mary in Virginia. Welcome, and over to you, Benny. Uh, well, thanks everyone for, for being here. Um, and there you go, Lucy. Um, so, why don't I start with um, perhaps asking the two of you uh, what subjects uh, you, you teach and perhaps the last course. You, you just taught. Um, we'll stop with you, we'll see it, then turn it over to Rick. Yes. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be part of this literary festival. Um, and thank you, many for uh, I teach in a department called the Asian American Studies at UCLA. It is the oldest Asian American Studies program. Um, in the United States, and probably in the world. <laughs> I think I can think that. And, and it is also, we became a department 10 years ago. Um, so it, the department is really only 10 years old. It is a math, they have a master's program, an undergraduate uh, BA program as well, and, and many, uh, uh, graduate of the master's program. Pleasure to see many all the time. Like this is the direction of Asian American studies that we're, we need to be at, we should be at, is what Ben is doing. Um, so wonderfully, you know, conversant in so many different fields. Uh, one that I think only now that Asian American studies can hope to be in terms of its aspirations toward a transnational. Uh, you know, curriculum and transnational studies. Um, so, I'll, oh, oh, yeah. And, and, and the last, yeah, the most recent course you okay. just Um I teach courses, and our department is still organized around the national food groups. The na national groups. So I teach a course on Filipino American studies. I'm also teaching a course called Introduction to Asian American Literatures and Cultures. Uh, and that's an introductory course for first year or new people, in the, uh, new students in the program. Um, and I recently developed a course called, um, it's on Central Valley. It's an area of California, which is inland. It's not, you know, kind of the Bay Area. Um, and thinking about the emergence of Asian American literature from the inlands, from this, you know, non metropolitan site. You know, authors that we now know, like Maxine Hong Kingston, Kukan Kotanda, all are from the Stockton, and, um, the inner, the 
heartland of California, not from urban city, not from LA, not necessarily from San Francisco. That's really interesting. That's really interesting. Um, and Benkins, uh, over to you. Yeah, I, uh, I teach South Asian and Global History at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. This is part of the UNC system, one of the 16 campuses uh, of the UNC system. This is a smaller campus. Chapel Hill is the flagship campus of the UNC system. And uh, this year, well, I kind of uh, arranged it in such a way that I could teach all my courses online, so I moved with my family to India. And uh, I'm teaching full time and studying. In fact, after I'm done with this session, I have to rush and st continue to grade and slot my grades in by by Friday, uh, by, by day after tomorrow, or else I'm in deep soup. But uh, yeah, this uh, this semester I'm teaching an overload. I've had to teach four courses, um, of which, uh, you know, there's uh, one course which I teach on global history from the revolutions of 1848 to the present, and that has two sections. Uh, there's a second course that I'm co-teaching with one of my colleagues. It's on you know, the British Empire, and uh, so he's an Irish historian. And so the first few uh, weeks, uh, you know, we teach some iconic texts uh, as far as imperialism is concerned. You know, beginning with you know, we take up somebody like Niall Ferguson, who's an apologist of the empire, to Edward Said, to David Canada, and you know, so. And then the, the second half, I pick up and talk about British Empire in India, in which again I try to pick up some, you know, uh, some fairly important texts, you know, including Chris Bailey's uh, Empire and Information, uh, or Shahid Amin's uh, Chauri Chaura, uh, then uh, of course, you know, Gyan Pandey's Construction of Communalism on Nick Turk's Cast of the Mind, uh, and finally, you know, this is a course which has given me some pleasure because of the sheer enthusiasm of the students. And these are online, this is an online class for existing high school teacher, existing high school teachers in North Carolina. And this is an eight week course. <coughs> and uh, the department asked me, you know, why don't you teach some course on India? And I decided to, you know, put together a course on Gandhi. And the specification was that, you know, these are already the full-time working teacher, high school teachers, so over eight weeks just pick up some four texts. So, uh, you know, I picked up something which could introduce them to, you know, Gandhian ideas of Satyagraha. So I picked up a very old text by Joan Bondurant, it's called The Conquest of Violence. Uh, the second text I picked up was uh, Mukulika Banerjee's Pathan Anand, you know, to kind of introduce them to this idea that uh, Gandhian non-violence is not something which is, you know, uh, because the Hindus are vegetarian and non-violent, and therefore, you know, this is something which can only happen in India and nowhere else. But to talk about the fact that in the wild west of this part of the world, you know, the Pathans, the guys who are killing the Americans in Afghanistan right now, this thing was fairly successful, uh, you know, 70 years ago. Uh, the third book that I have taught them is, you know, an introductory text which was written by David Hardiman on Gandhi, Gandhi in his time and ours. And the last text that I have used for this course is, you know, a Gandhian critique of colonialism, which is Ashish Nandi's The Intimate Enemy. So these are the four texts that I have used, and uh, I've been very busy this semester grading every week, every day. Yeah. So we, we just, uh, the Oh, my own question. Yeah. So I, I just got done teaching uh, a course called uh, Portuguese India, Lost Texts, Family Worlds, which uh, focuses on uh, the idea of Portuguese India in literature. But I also wanted to talk about, uh, talk to my students about diaspora and um, identity in, in association with the idea of Portuguese India uh, in, in literature. So we, we, we read a whole bunch of novels. Um, very long service, um, and, and there's actually folks at this festival whose work feature uh, feature on my service, including actually Veronica, who is meant to be on this panel and is quietly sitting in the front row. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a really interesting course, um, which actually leads me to to my next question. Uh, oh, and and Sabi is here as well, whose whose work was also on my service. Um, I, I was thinking, as, as both of you were speaking about curriculum building, but also the idea of land, um, 
given that we just heard the Ombaker lecture uh, about land and its importance to identity. Um, teaching as I do in the Asian and Middle Eastern Studies program, I'm often struck by the impossibility of teaching about Asia and Middle East in, in its entirety, right? And, and uh, it strikes me that particularly with the areas that the two of you work with, right, uh, Asian America and South Asia, right, the, the impossibility of, you know, how does one, how does one do curriculum building uh, with this sort of essentialized notion of this is a space that one works with, right? But then also the impossibility of covering the entirety of you know, the, the, the space itself. So, okay. um, the first thing I need to kind of mention is that um, in the great state of North Carolina, you know, according to this is mandated legislation that 80% uh, of your students have to be local. So 80% of my students are from small towns of North Carolina and uh, very often uh, the first people in their family to go to college. And so these people come through the high school, high school system in North Carolina, come to, uh, come to UNCW, and they really don't have much of an idea about the world at large. So I, you know, I, ha I kind of keep that at the top of my mind, and uh, the idea is to just give them, a, you know, to get them started on something, uh, not be terribly ambitious when it comes to designing a course, uh, and I hope that, you know, they get it all at the end of the semester. So I never go with that assumption, and, you know, this is something, this is, this is a lesson learned over, over several semesters of teaching. Um, so, you know, the, half my job load is to teach this um, survey course, it's a 101 kind of thing, global history, you know, and that's divided into two, two parts. One is from, you know, from Columbus to the revolutions of 1848, and the second one is from the revolutions of 1848, which happened in Europe till the present. And the way the division of labor happens in the department, you know, the Americanists teach, of course, U.S. history. The Europeans teach uh, Western civilization, and we, from the rest of the world, teach global history. Uh, so, you know, even though I wasn't terribly, uh, you know, educated or you know, I didn't know much about Chinese history or parts of Middle Eastern history, I had to, I had to keep just one step ahead of my students uh, and appear, you know, confident and cool in front of a classroom. You know, only the previous night I would be reading something to kind of, you know, stare. Try, you know, put together a lecture. I, I need to learn some tricks to try to do that. So, uh, so the, this is this this course in global history. Practically every student in the university has to take, and this is part of the being global citizens. You know, so educating global citizens in the United States. So that's what keeps the department going. You know, because we have a short uh, intake, or you know. Our classes are full always, so that makes sure that you know my job is also secure, as as would the jobs of others in the department. So we try to uh, uh, you know give them you know to begin with very basic information about the world at large, and then you know hopefully they develop the critical legs on which to run um, and understand the story. So yeah, introduce you know. The spread of modernity, let's say, from the 1840s onwards to through the rest of the world, how you know in Europe something happens, and so that that is the conventional storyline that we follow, that kind of also carry everybody along, even though you know uh, the, the story of modernity is much more complicated and much more global, and not just something confined to Europe. This is something which we try to put across, but yeah, generally uh, you know modernity beginning in Europe, and how of course radiates outwards, leads to the growth of colonies, and you know, then of course, decolonization, the Cold War, end of Cold War, the US as a source of power, and challenges in the present. And as part of this course, we also try to use some iconic texts uh, of literature, nonfiction, or whatever. And over the years, I kind of change one book every semester. And over the years, I've used, uh, you know, Chino Achebe's Things Fall Apart. I've used, uh, 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 
you know, I use one or two texts on, you know, uh, because if one of the great challenges of the 21st century is the ecological challenge, I use a couple of texts. One is Tom Friedman's Hot, Flat and Crowded, which gives them a certain sense that we have a stake in this whole business. We can save the world, you know, as Tom Friedman would put it. Uh, so I, teach, I use that text. And the second one I use is uh, uh, The Omnivore's Dilemma, Michael Pollan. Like, what you eat, how does it affect you, and how does it affect the environment? So texts of this kind. So I, you know, I also pick texts from China, from Middle East, from different parts of the world to, you know, teach this class. Yeah. Thanks for that question, Benny. I, I, you know, I think the one of the things I feel very lucky about is that by the time I started teaching, there's been there has been existing critique of this representational approach. Right here and then, although like I said, my department is still kind of organized. Um, for instance, other faculty members, you know, they, they other courses are on Chinese American experience, Wu Chiang experience, um, and and I think in that way, I don't, you know, there's also a sense of relief, which is like, okay, there's other courses on American experience. And, um, although there has been, at least in the, the classes I, I teach, I've tried to do comparative, like where these different communities might converge, and say something like a section on the Japanese American experience, it's always sort of around the Japanese American internment, right? But that is also emphasizing, try to include literature and materials that that policy is across the Americas and elsewhere, right? So, um, because it's so much, you know, there's an idea of, that's been critiqued by Asian American studies is that it's so U.S. nation right? So how do you open that up beyond? I also, my own research talk is on the U.S. empire, and so that's, that I try to kind of have that inform what I teach, um, and that the U.S. empire doesn't you know, uh, the U.S. nation, uh, territorial nation, just doesn't suck in California. I think in terms of U.S. relations, that that informs how I. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I think that's the funky one. So yeah. So this is um, the the U. That that. Um, my own research on U.S. and Philippine imperial histories that have had me thinking about like, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, um, Cuba. Um, and so that's when I, I know when I was two, here two years ago, just having a conversation between you and Jason and, Jason and hearing people talk about the history of empire here in Goa. Um, there's so much, I'm always like, like we need to do a comparative project between the Philippines and also I'm thinking about like how much uh, American exceptionalism informs my work, uh, both in research. I do have a monograph and it's called Poor Arte, Filipinas and the Stages of Empire. It's, you can find that information on my bio. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's what I want to say. Um, in terms of you know the challenges of representational approach, that you can never sort of cover all, all of it. Um, so try, I think similarly, I, t I try and just work with something conceptually. I use a lot of Lisa Lil's work, um, Immigrant Acts in particular, and she how she sort of grounds the history and experience of Asian American experience with this idea of contradictory condition. I think that's really useful, especially for my introductory courses and how to think about Asian American cultural production, not always as resistive, okay? um, but how it opens it up to other a critique of, say, how memory and commemoration works in the context of the American state. Okay. Oh, I also wanted to bring up um, this idea of proper, the proper subject, which is what haunts, I think, this Asian American studies. 
that it's you know simply Asians in the United States and that history. So how do you open that out? Like I said, I kind of come at it through the idea of uh, U.S. empire and the migrant subjects of that and how they, they come to the United States. There's also you talking about your students. Uh, I, you know, I said, oh, also the idea of a proper subject in Asian American studies also applies to the proper students of Asian American studies. I think there's still this fantasy that it's people like me who grew up from working class, my, a migrant, I'm from a working class family, uh, the first being educated, you know, in, in to actually achieve higher education um, in my family. You know, those are not the students I'm teaching. One time, I actually I teach at UCLA, and you know it's such a, a highly regarded institution, right? And the students. One time, I was asking, I was trying to give and trying to have a conversation with students about working and how even when they schedule courses, like I went to a graduate program and I taught undergraduate students who were, you know mostly Asian Americans who are from refugee families, um, and they work. And so they had to really think about their schedule during the day. And so I was trying to have a conversation with my students. I also teach courses in theater, so they're required to see theater works, which is predominantly at night. So I said, you know, for those of you who might be working, we can talk about other possibilities, you know, what other options you could have. And at some point, I just paused because they just totally, I was like talking to no one there. And they were, I said, does anybody here work? Um, and then one really good looking young Filipino student said, yes, I have an audition actually. I cannot go to see the show. Now we're in LA, of course, it's, you know, a Hollywood industry. That's a predominant industry. That was an example of work not to undermine it. I work in theater. I appreciate, you know, I appreciate that work. But he was the one student who, who raised his hand and he said, does anybody here have a job or work? One student out of this 25 students, which is not the case, you know. Yeah, like most of my students, most of my students hold, hold not just one, but two or three jobs. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it's very rural and a whole lot of these students are not supported by their family. They, they take financial aid or, you know, they, they do two or three jobs, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and what you were saying, Vic, is um, first generation, isn't it? Um, and I think, Lucy, what, you, what you're pointing to is the ways in which uh, UCLA, which is a public university, uh, is now literally no longer. Okay. Thank you, uh, Benny. That, that's correct. Um, I, you know, it's it's really it's astonishing to me. And one of the things I want to say about the title of this session is Asianizing the the American curriculum. And I mentioned to Benny as somebody who um, is trained in Asian American studies. There was a moment in the field where there was so much. Tension, thank you, um, between and you know wanting to demarcate what's an Asian American and what is Asian, and that uh, the separation, that clarity, because there's you know the, anything associated with Asian, and you know because we were Americans, they wanted to be clear that we too are Americans. That was the point of entry, right? Um, and so that reflected on the, um, a little bit on the curriculum and the program building um, that I think now Asian American studies has had to really confront itself about because of this transnationalization. And also, I'm very curious about the formation of this Asian and Middle East. Um, I think that that's really interesting, and I would love to hear more about how that. No, I, I think uh, the, the program of William and Mary it, it is useful that um, they, they, they're thinking about it in terms of Asia and the Middle East, where on the one hand, yes, the Middle East is part of the continent of Asia, but at the same time, it, 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 it is a different formation that does require 
uh, more attention put towards it, right? Um, but then we can also think about the ways in which, for example, a place like Goa, uh, being on the on the coast, um, has been uh, has has, exper has had multiple experiences with different parts of the world pre-European contact, right? So I think that there, there need to be different ways of thinking about these these connections between Asia and the Middle East. Absolutely. Um, while, while the two of you were speaking uh, in response to the, the, this, this question I just asked, uh, it, it struck me that you know uh, we're also thinking a little bit about identity. And, and the, the first part of uh, the title for this uh, panel is Brandish. Um, when when uh, I taught uh, the, the first year, William and Mary, because none, uh, you know I, I was new, uh, and no one really knew, knew who I was, and, and I had uh, six people sign up for my course, of which uh, only four actually showed up. So it was great. You know, we had we had lovely conversations every time. Uh, and and then the second year, I had um, like 24 people sign up, and, and the title of the course, like I said, was Portuguese India Lost Text Bank World. Way too long of titles. The, the registrar decided to shorten it to just. India lost text fan world and in the front row were like you know the, the front row is entirely South Asian and uh, I showed I opened the class by showing uh, the, the, the tourism department of Goa's uh, promotional video you can find it on YouTube it's like 10 to 12 minutes long and it's, it's horrendous it's, it's a really really terrible video and, and one of the things that they say in, in, in doing this video is something about how you can come to Goa for all kinds of you know great food and I made the point to my, uh, oh, and, and, and you see uh, lots of European tourists um, in, in this video, which really is not any longer the case so much, you know, that you see European tourists, you're more likely to see uh, affluent uh, South Asians from other parts of, of the country and that, and then, and then also uh, people from other uh, parts of backgrounds, right? So I, the point I made to my students was that really what this video was trying to do was to say to Indian tourists, Come to Goa so you have access to white bodies, right? Uh, and, and then, and then also, um, yeah. So this, uh, we then talked about you know the representation of cuisine in the video, and this uh, South Asian person that was in the front row said, "Well, I've been to the real India, and I'm a vegetarian, so I, I don't know what this business is about you know cuisine that's available in India. Clearly, uh, in Goa, clearly they're trying to say that you know uh, you can have this exotic experience." Beef, right? And so then I said to her, well, did you know that, that India is actually the, one of the largest consumers of and exporters of beef? And she was, she was like, you know, completely visibly taken aback. And, and it also struck me that she was enacting her own high caste background by saying, you know, I'm, I'm the, I, I know the real India and, and I'm, I'm vegetarian. Um, the next time my class met, all of the brown people disappeared. Uh, <laughs> And I was faced with the prospect for the first time ever in my life having a class that was majority white. And, and uh, that was, uh, you know, as a, as a fairly new professor, that was a rather profoundly different experience for me. So anyway, this brings me, that, that long-winded explanation brings me to this question of how do you manage, so, you know, think in your case, uh, teaching in a largely rural setting where you primarily have white students but who are working class, right? And then on the other extreme to some extent, Lucy, having um, you know, the West Coast empowered Asian American subject, you know, sometimes, not always. Um, how does one, you know, how does one grapple with these issues of identity uh, vis-a-vis branding the curriculum or Asian arts the curriculum as well? The other point that I wanted to make, kind of returning to now how Asian American studies has had to grapple with this, you know, its moment of rejecting or demarcating itself so clearly between what is Asian and what is Asian American is, now UCLA, is, I'm, I'm sure in other universities in, in the U.S., is so aggressively recruiting international students and these international students at UCLA come in majority, predominantly East Asia, China, Hong Kong, Singapore. Um, and I think that that, you know, is a question that really our department needs to think about because a number of our faculty 
they they are assuming the role. We're going to translate American for these students. We're going to teach them what is American, so that when they go back to where they come from, then they can have that kind of professionalism. Um, I mean, I've had some really interesting experience with the relationship to what is teaching or how. Um, one time I was teaching in my introduction to Philippine American Studies, and there were seated in a row of students, and they would, I'm giving my lecture, and they keep talking, and it, I had to at some point stop. I said, you know, you're, I'm sorry, but you need to stop talking because you're distracting me. And um, it turns out, at, at the end of the app, at the end of the lecture, um, the students, so they're kind of talking to each other, and then you go, you go. They sent one, you know, in the group, they were, they would send one student to ask me a question, and they'd go back and then tell my answer to the rest of the group. Um, they're like, well, aren't the students from Hong Kong? Well, they speak English, and I'm like, yeah, but not all English is the same, obviously. And then my points of reference are always American, and I apparently have an accent. Um, and so they, that chatting, when they were talking, they were actually translating. I said, oh my, this is so interesting. <laughs> so I think there's some tensions in the classroom that are happening as well. Um, between the student, American students and international students. So that's, that's what I want to share. How, how do you deal with, uh, you know, I, I, the, what I was thinking of more specifically to, I, I guess, to, to um, delve into my question a little bit deeper, is on the one hand you've got uh, these students who are wise, right, but at the same time are working class and can very easily become, so this is one of the, the, the tensions I think I faced in my class, where, um, um, was not was not presenting uh, what should be uh, this side of needing a failure, right? Uh, so to be able to explore identities of caste, gender, sexuality, and so on, without the white person in the room feeling like they needed to look at the East as this, you know, this object that needed saving. Um, so I, but you know, I think uh, it's, it's basically the question of that dealing with white privilege, but at the same time, dealing with a white, white privileged subject who is still, at the same time, perhaps working class, which is not the case at the college I teach at, where, you know, it's a, a high for losing school, so, you yeah. know. That's, uh... Okay. No, that's fine. That's okay. It gives me a couple of more moments to think about it. <laughs> No, we'll, we'll open it to Q&A after this, how about that? Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, the, uh, the challenge is to, yeah, in a way, um, teach uh, India or South Asia in a way uh, so as to not make them think that this is a world which needs to be saved. Uh, but I think the other thing I forgot to mention as far as the background of my students is concerned, you know, Wilmington is very close to three major U.S. military bases. Yeah? So there is Camp Lejeune, there's Fort Bragg, and the third one I'm forgetting. So we do have a ton of uh, you know, military installations and a whole lot of returning students, that is, people who have served in Afghanistan or in uh, Iraq uh, who come. So in every semester, I do have two or three or four students who are, you know, these returning uh, veterans, you know, who are on the GI Bill and, you know, they're getting this money to kind of complete their undergraduate education. And uh, so there is, these people have been there. Uh, they have experienced it to a certain extent, even though, you know, much of the time they may be at Bagram, you know, not having gotten how much or whatever it is. But uh, they, they do, uh, there is therefore this, generally this 
demand to, to, to be taught these courses so that they can understand this part of the world better, where they have been uh, embroiled for the past, you know, ever since 9-11, they have not, not gotten all of that Islam. So uh, they are very interested in, of course, Islam, the Islamic world, Pakistan, on which also I teach courses. So, uh, yeah, part of it is about knowing these areas where we are stuck and we are getting our butts kicked. So, uh, yeah. No, no, that, that, that's actually really interesting. And it is the flip side of what Lucy is saying about being the sort of like cultural translator who then sends out the Asian students with uh, knowledge of America. Yeah. Uh, is there a mic? Yeah, open it up to Q&A from the audience. So is, is there a mic going around? Uh, <laughs> let, let's have on Julie and, 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 then, and then Mark. How about that? <laughs> I, I'll get it. I'll get it. I just I just want to thank the, the panelists for their wonderful observations, but also I teach in feminist studies and South Asian studies. So I just want to say that teaching difference in the US, whether it's through Asian American studies or area studies, which is what Venkat and I do, but I also do feminist studies, is just as complicated as teaching Goa in Bombay. Right, so if you're trying to figure out a relationship between what they're speaking about, try to think about how difficult it is to teach the diversity of Goa cultures to people in the mainland, right? So this is some of the same questions that they're grappling with. But to just um, ask a question which you may or may not um, answer, is how do you deal with the idea of, um, um, you know, Asian America itself becoming a category that's changing? So right now, uh, in a, the idea of Asian America includes Arab Americans, so people from West Asia, like Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, right? So that is also complicated matters. Just like you were saying, you teach in Asian American studies and Middle Eastern studies, that distinction is just like for us who work in South Asia, Indian Ocean studies has really transformed the periodizations and temporalities that we traverse, right? So. I'll be really brief. Uh, so, I've been teaching South Asia the last semester uh, in, to, to, to your abused. Portuguese, kind of your Portuguese. Portuguese, not your This is true. This is true. This is true. Um, and, and, and it comes up with, um, We are Portuguese, we can say. Yeah, this is true. This is true. Um, so, this is basically like the tensions I've experienced while, while teaching this. Is point one, um, having taught South Asia to South Asians, it's completely different from teaching. The, the demands you expect of your students are completely different. You realize these guys have no clue how to live outside of a fairly, even though Portuguese is quite good, uh, 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 live in a diverse society. So that's like a major challenge. Then subsequently there are challenges the, the tension that you bring in, you want to make sure that they don't collapse India into Hinduism, right? You want to make sure that they don't have this idea that India is a land of peace and spirituality. So you introduce them to caste and caste violence. And then, that's when it hits you. Then you start feeling guilty that you are giving this terrible image of your country uh, to these people because then it goes back into this Orientalist thing, oh yeah, these people are really crazy out there. So like there is lots of tension that you really need to negotiate all the time. It's exhausting. Yeah. Welcome to teaching. <laughs> Any responses to that, please? No? Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I had my back. Please, responses, go ahead. We have a couple of minutes. Go ahead, please. I think the comments sort of provided answers already, right? That's, they're so smart. Um, they should really be on the panel. <laughs> um, like Jason's sort of brownish, right? <laughs> he's, he's brownish. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm also reminded, though, in, in response to Anjali's question, uh, of the work of your colleague, Peter Pascara, 
Who writes a model minority imperialism, and, and he makes this brilliant point about how um, the, the, the project of empire uh, is, is the work of managing multiculturalism. And I wonder if that's also, the, you know, this speaks to what you, you, were, you were talking about, Jason, but it's also, I think, the project of globalization in many ways, right? And, and so we are, you know, these fraught native opponents in some way. <laughs> it's not really so. Yeah. We have one question from Brian, and then we'll stop. Hi, this is Brian here. I was very impressed listening to the discussions I just uh, briefly stepped in for. I need some help from those of you on the panel here. I teach American Studies at Carmel College, and I've been at my wit's end. <laughs> trying to put together a course on uh, American Studies for an Allied paper at second year BA. Uh, we do have a smattering of texts and we do have a smattering of impulses and perspectives which we can use. But being second year BA, that semester four, the teacher has a carte blanche to do whatever he or she wants to do. Which we have done pretty well so far. Uh, can I ask the worthy panelists for some uh, directions in which I could take my students on this paper too. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, perhaps that could be answered. Uh, we need to do a yeah. workshop, right. curriculum workshop. That's you know for the seventh uh, go of the test. I think that's, come a, back. that's an excellent idea, and we'd love to have you back. And actually, uh, I know Benny has been working on. Uh, teaching Goa to his students in a very intriguing way, which in fact we don't have in Goa itself. Uh, it's a, quite a remarkable uh, set of texts that he exposes his students to, which I wish uh, were, were used here in Goa, but unfortunately they're not. Um, so I think that those are, those are very interesting things. We can work on those things. I see no reason why we can't develop a set of modules, a set of texts for teaching America in India, for teaching India. Uh, period for teaching all of us, really, um, and a number of the topics and, we've and we if, I could, if I could just add, uh, Brian is doing really amazing work, uh, uh, and the, the Muse India, uh, you know, uh, he, he edited the, the Muse India issue on, on Goa, uh, and I'd be happy to talk to you more, Brian, about, uh, you know, possible ways of, of you know, developing your curriculum. Uh, I think that the most important thing to keep in mind is uh, uh, about doing American uh, studies from multiple perspectives, and not thinking of America as just, you know, the United States. Thank you so much for an excellent time. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Vinkar. Thank you, Benny. Brownish, Asianizing the American curriculum.